All right, here we go. Starting the next unit in ESS, we are looking at flipped notes number seven. Geologic time. So make sure you have your uh, packet in front of you and you fill in the blanks as we go. Let's take a look. Let's get started and start talking about the age of the earth. So historical geology is a branch of the geosciences that deals with um, the Earth's past and tries to answer questions about how old is the Earth? How did certain rock layers that we might see at places like the Grand Canyon or Zion National Park or Bryce, things like that, how did they get there? What processes were involved in them being uh, laid down and ultimately eroded? Other questions like fossils and how fossils change. Where did they come from and why do we find them where we do find them? Uh, in addition, geologists try and piece things together in a proper sequence, in the correct order. What came first? What different geologic eons and eras preceded others? And lastly, is it possible to actually timestamp or put very specific dates on events in Earth's past. Example would be something along the lines of geologists um, believe that the dinosaurs and many other organisms were wiped out about 65 million years ago. Well, where in the world did they get that time stamp of 65 million years ago? So we can think of Earth's past uh, the history of the Earth is like a giant, complicated set of history books. Basically like an encyclopedia set of history books. It's already been written down. It got written as the events were happening. Um, but now here we are in present day, and geologists have to go back in time. They're great detectives. They go back and try and piece together all the different volumes and all the different chapters and all the different pages that were originally written down in this history book. So what do they have to study in order to do that? Well, they got to go all over, um, all over the planet to different locations, study old rocks, study old processes, look at different fossils, uh, look at different fossils, different organisms, and try and put things together in their proper sequence and their proper ages and in their proper locations. This is not an easy task for geologists to do. So one of the places that uh, geologists might go would be to this location. This is a place in Utah called Canyonlands National Park. And you can see all the different rock layers, all the different strata here. And they're almost like pages in a book. They read like pages in a book. And you can discern information about what was happening during the particular times that they were being uh, formed and deposited. The problem with this, uh, the problem for geologists, is that when they're going back and piecing together all the different pages, all the different um, events, all the different eons and eras that have been in Earth's past, is that erosion gets in the way. Erosion comes along and actually destroys many of the pages. So pages are partially damaged or smudged, and the ones from the earliest chapters from when Earth was just forming and when it was uh, very, very young, those might be completely missing. It'd be very difficult to find information from a long, long time ago. So, if you try to get uh, a, complete, um, a complete timeline of Earth's history, it is darn near impossible. Very difficult because there's always going to be an missing information. Okay? However, there is hope. There is enough of the original story left behind and preserved in rocks that geologists have been able to piece together and decipher and ultimately interpret what we think is a relatively reliable story of Earth's history. We call this reconstructed history of the Earth the geologic time scale. This geologic time scale is subdivided into different eons, eras, periods, and epochs getting uh, subsequently smaller and smaller and smaller time divisions when we know enough detail. 
So let's start with how old is the earth? When was the earth born? What did that look like? Okay, we talked about the nebular theory for solar system formation. Talked about how um, the sun formed and the earth was a young protoplanet and how that was been estimated about 4.6 billion years ago. But this understanding of how old the solar system is is a relatively recent um, discovery and a recent realization. Before that, the thoughts were that the Earth was very, very young. Hmm? Uh, most of the estimates of the age of the Earth were based upon religious uh, texts, um, particularly the Old Testament, certainly here in the Western, um, the Western world. The earth was thought to be relatively young. And in fact, a fellow by the name of Archbishop Usher, he used Old Testament chronologies. And if you've ever uh, read anything in Genesis or First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles uh, in the Old Testament and the Bible, you uh, will remember that they talk about uh, lineage, heritage, generations about one um, particular man was so many years old when he had this child, who was then this old when he had this child, who was then this old when he had this child, and this old when he had this child, etc., etc., etc. Well, Archbishop Usher did exactly that, except he went in reverse order, and he went all the way back to Adam and Eve in Genesis, and he calculated, based upon that, that the earth actually was created in 4004 BC. And in fact, he put a date on it. It was in October 4004 BC. And this was in the 1600s. So the Earth was thought to be just on the order of thousands of years old. Shortly after that, especially after the scientific revolution, scientists came along and wanted to um, validate that or invalidate it, but um, really use scientific methods to try and determine the age of the Earth, some observational empirical methodology. And some examples were a French scientist tried to calculate the age of the Earth based upon the rate of cooling. He estimated the Earth was uh, 80,000 years old, that it originally was a giant molten ball of iron, and it took 80,000 years. Um, in the 1890s, an Irish scientist tried to calculate the age based upon how long it would take the Earth's oceans to become salty, using the assumption that they started as fresh water. And he came up with an estimate of 90 million years old. And there were others, uh, other methods that were used scientifically to try and find the age of the Earth. Um, but about 100 years ago, a French couple, Madame and Pierre Curie, discovered or were involved with the discovery of radioactivity. They weren't the only ones, but they helped to discover the essence of radioactivity. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about radioactivity, this unit, and how it is used. Um, through, their, um, through their work, they actually discovered two new elements, polonium and radium. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize in 1903. They actually named polonium after Mary's uh, home country. She wasn't French. Where was she from if they named it after polonium? That's right. She was from Poland. Huh? And Lord Rutherford also was involved uh, quite a bit with radioactivity. You probably remember him uh, from your chemistry class. But he also helped realize... The, uh, what was going on with some of these radioactive elements, and that is the half-life decay rates. So using half-life decay rates, understanding <clears throat> that these elements will decay in a predictable um, time rate helps scientists to, to agree upon the nice round number for the age of the Earth, not only the Earth, but the solar system. The age of the solar system is approximated at 4.6 billion years old. You'll sometimes see 4.5 billion years old. Okay? So this is um, 
what geologists have come to agree upon as the age of the earth. So when you are asked, how old is the earth believed to be by geologists, this is what we're looking for, 4.6 billion years. So once the age of the earth was established and agreed upon by a geologist, uh, they needed to start looking at how the surface of the earth changed through time. For the longest time, the earth was believed to be very static. The mountains are where they have always been. The oceans are where uh, they have always been. Rivers have always run the same course that they're running now and things like that. Uh, but then it was kind of realized that the earth's surface is very dynamic and it does change over time. Um, so we're going to compare and contrast a couple different schools of thought um, here, a couple of your terms. The first is a term called catastrophism. All right? Catastrophism was an early idea of how the Earth's surface changed. And what is the root word that catastrophism comes from? What do you think? Yeah, you got it. It's catastrophe, which means disaster, global disaster. All right, so catastrophism is a hypothesis about how the Earth's surface changes, that Earth's surface features have been formed and have been altered by great disasters in a very, very short time span. And these major uh, global catastrophic events really don't occur anymore. So using um, kind of using the Bible and other uh, historical or religious historical uh, stories as an example would be the global flood or giant earthquakes. Things like that formed the great layers or giant earthquakes early on formed the mountains of the earth and then those mountains were in place and the oceans were in place and that's where they've always been and these disasters just don't occur anymore on that scale. Okay. Now contrast that with a doctrine called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism, that's a fancy nine-syllable word. Say that. Uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism was coined by this man, James Hutton. All right, James Hutton is one of the scientists that uh, you need to know about in this unit. He was a Scottish scientist that uh, spent a lot of time traveling around his native Scotland and also in the rest of Britain and he would um, examine the rock layers and the idea that they formed very quickly and then don't change didn't make sense to him so through observation he came up with the idea of uniformitarianism of course the root word for that is what? uniform meaning same so what he said in stark contrast to catastrophism, what he said was that the geologic processes that we see going on today, the earthquake, those processes, things like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, erosion, um, ocean tides, uh, river drainage patterns that have changed, those things that we see going on today, those have always gone on throughout Earth's history. And it's those same processes, same slow processes of erosion have changed the Earth. They have indeed changed them, but it didn't happen overnight with a global earthquake. It would happen over thousands, if not millions of years. So in fact, he believed that the Earth was millions, if not hundreds of millions of years old because it takes these incredibly long time spans for any noticeable change to occur. And that is what uniformitarianism actually means. So with catastrophism and uniformitarianism kind of uh, standing in stark contrast with each other, the reality is that um, geologists would probably agree um, when I say that uniformitarianism is the guiding force, that it's slow, that the earth does change slowly over time, but every so often there are catastrophic events that can alter 
the um, whoops I can't spell yeah, I can't spell it wasn't even close catastrophic all right it's a catastrophic spelling error right there all right so <laughs> the idea is that um, you do have catastrophic events that every so often do change things quite significantly for instance an asteroid meteor impact that wipes out 80 percent of the world's species. Okay. So let's talk about how we do date things and put them in the proper order. There's two ways to date, um, two ways to find out how old things are. One of them is absolute dating. This is one of your vocabulary terms. An absolute date gives you an actual definite age before present. In other words, it gives you a number. It gives you a number of years before present. Relative dating. Now, this is what they do in Mississippi, um, but for ESS, relative dating talks about <clears throat> the sequence of things, putting events in their proper um, proper formation, what came first, what came next, what came after that, and then what came most recently, the order of formation, geologic sequencing. Okay, so here's some uh, examples. If I were to tell you, hey, put these events in uh, their proper sequence. All right, we talk about uh, event number one, the discovery of America by Columbus. Event number two, the most recent ice age. Event number three, um, <clears throat> the U.S. Civil War. And event number four, um, event number four would be um, the extinction of the dinosaurs. And lastly, we'll throw in one more. Event number um, five would be the assassination of JFK. You could put all these in their proper sequence and give them relative dates. What would they be? Death of the dinosaurs would come first. The Ice Age would be second. Um, Columbus coming to the New World and discovering um, North America would be third. The U.S. Civil War would be fourth. And then JFK would be most recent, the last. That's relative dating. Absolute dating tries to tell us how many years before present each of these actually happen. We can put numbers on those. I won't necessarily go through that exercise, but both of these have their purpose. You might say, well, obviously if you find absolute dates, you are finding relative dates. That is true, right? But you cannot always find the absolute date of everything. So relative dating certainly is important and has its place.